questions about gender, indigenous feminism, their, their ways into those hard conversations. They provide a political theory that helps us to have some of those conversations. One of the things that happens is because only certain people speak, the same power systems get replicated. It's a difficult process of having these uncomfortable conversations, but understanding that the implications of not having these conversations is devastating. We're talking about violence against women, uh, against girls, right? We're talking about violence against transgendered people, violence against a lot of other groups that are, you know, two-spirited, however we want to refer to, to folks, um, that is often ignored or marginalized. And so in doing that, we're marginalizing folks from the discussion. Women's issues are the issues of the people. The big issues of, the big sexy issues of self-government and self-determination and sovereignty, those are women's issues, right? And so how do we have a conversation where women aren't constantly eclipsed out of the picture? Law is worked out in community. It is a practice, which means that it has to be accessible to all people. So there's really an impulse to look to widespread engagement in the uh, living of Indigenous law. We live in a society in which there is sexism in settler society and in Indigenous communities. Um, you know, this sexism is systemic in that it is really built into institutions. So for example, law, it's built into norms. So ideas about what is normal in our everyday lives and homophobia and transphobia, these get taken up and they get perpetuated, um, sometimes unintentionally by a lot of people. Stereotypes and generalizations can be very damaging because what they do is they limit the way people can function within the legal system by assigning them roles that might not necessarily be what their gifts are and what their talents are. It also can be damaging because it can diminish people. Historically, women have been greatly diminished by understandings and stereotypes that assign men all the important roles in the development of Indigenous law. At one end of the spectrum are the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And at the other end of the spectrum are the stereotypes, the essentializations, all of the conventions that are unquestioned. And there's lots of places in between where there are decisions made which are oppressive or constraining. All of those different aspects of life are about creating the conditions which can result in violence against Indigenous women and girls in the worst form. the term now, although I wasn't always comfortable with it. There's lots of different ways of, of, of looking at it. That, and you know that we don't say feminism, we say feminisms with an S. It is a feminist understanding of the world, but through this understanding of also being Indigenous as well, which has its own particular history with dealing with people in society. A lot of uh, settler colonialism kind of thinking that has to be dealt with and unpacked. Thinking about Indigenous feminism is extremely important for being able to then account for the ways that colonization and sexism um, and also how oppression around sexuality related to homophobia, how these are all connected. These are all forms of oppression that work together in their violence and they harm people in very particular um, and profound ways. You need to make sure that, you know, you're constantly evaluating who has power and why and who's you know benefiting from any decisions or any of that work. Mm -hmm.
Feminism for me is so much about, it's a doing thing, it's action, it's, it's about transformation, it's about social change, and not just for women, but you know, for, in, in ways that benefits um, children as well. Starting to learn some of these Indigenous laws, working my way into some of them, is thinking about the kinds of stories that are sometimes available there that actually have more robust, nuanced, open space for looking in, where the stories often work with questions of land or animal in a way that I think makes it easier to think about transformations and decenter the traditional ways we have of thinking about gender that enable us to work with those stories in ways that uh, open up space for questions. We have many stories that talk about abuse and violence and murder and uh, women not being given place in the political system. And these stories help us understand what our responsibilities are because they're directed towards a critique of the way that women have been treated. And we can see those stories as a resource as to what we might do today, either to analogize if there's a way that they dealt with that violence in a positive way, if they didn't, we can distinguish, saying we're not going to do that today just because our ancestors lived like that once upon a time and that way we don't have to pick up that pattern of behavior uh, today. So those stories function that way and they just also show us that there was never a time when we didn't need law because it's always been the case that we've struggled as human beings, including in our relationships uh, related to gender. So a couple years ago I started painting ravens for the most part, I paint uh, grandmother ravens, kokum ravens. I wanted a female trickster, and I also wanted her to be old and kick ass. And so she wears a little kerchief, and I imagine her as being born and reborn of indigenous feminist consciousness from the world over. And she teaches us by slapping us upside the head by being funny, by being loving, by being bizarre, sometimes just uh, causing us to see things differently if we're open to it. And that is where the hope of reconciliation lies, is in taking our notion of law back down to engagement in a concrete way with stories, to have the story become this occasion for us to ask, what happens when people don't fulfill their obligations? What are the various ways that this could spill out? How can you imagine that this story could have ended differently if something had, had happened otherwise? So what we work at developing is the capacity to become legal interpreters. So to the capacity to see stories in the world as ways for you to think with and against, not to just replicate, oh, the answer to the story is... Mm. But that means it's back to the collaborative processes. It's back to having the opportunity to hear other people tell you about the story, not to trump your version of it, but to see how a story both can be riven through with homophobia, with sexism, with uh, violence, and yet uh, provide an opportunity to see additional things in there. There's a need for new stories to relate our teachings to those responsibilities that we have today. I think over time, they're gonna come from our dreams, they're gonna come from individuals taking leadership. When we create that space for understanding that law never interprets itself, it's always interpreted by human beings, so what are the terms of that interpretation? It's a human process. Then everybody can ask questions about it. And that's how you get into talking about power. That's how you get into to seeing those issues. All of these different kinds of things, gender and citizenship, if we can shake up some of the assumptions that shape what we see in the world, then we create new ground and new possibilities for reconciliation. But it's going to take a lot of work, uh, individually and collectively, on all of our parts to do that.